Welcome to this edition of Lexington Remembers. My name is Dan Fenn, and it's my real pleasure and delight to, to welcome to our program one of Lexington's real jewels, Reggie O'Hare Gibson, uh, familiar to many of you. Uh, and he's gonna, we're going to talk together about how he came to Lexington and uh, what uh, he does and what uh, life is, is uh, like in, in his line of work and, and any particular memories that he has as to how, thoughts he has to how Lexington's changed since he, in, in, since he uh, arrived here. So, so uh, you haven't always lived in Lexington. I have not. I have not. When I first moved here to, to Massachusetts from Chicago, um, in the winter of 2000, I moved to Belmont. That's where, uh, where my wife lived, in Belmont. And we moved to Lexington about 10, 10 to 11 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So you're, uh, are you feeling a part of the community? Or I am. Do people, yeah. I am. I am. I'm feeling very much a part of the community. Um, people ask me to do things which are community-based. Um, I hardly ever say no to that. Um, I'm a member. I have a, a spiritual community that I found here, a church community in Lexington. And I'm involved with that, as well as my wife, Katie O'Hare Gibson. She's involved with that. Um, I'm also involved with, um, with Boy Scouts. I do stuff with them. And also with the uh, William Diamond Jr. Drum and Fife Corps. I have some, my sons are also part of that. So, yeah, it's a lot of things in Lexington. Uh, I'm quite a townie, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Now, you were born and bred in Chicago? I was born in Mississippi, and I was raised in Chicago. Okay, yeah. and and uh, how did um, it's kind of a ways from Chicago? <laughs> well, which part, Mississippi or yeah, Massachusetts? Well, both. But I was thinking of Lexington. Oh, Lexington is a ways. Yeah, in many ways, it's a long way from Chicago. At least yeah. from the Chicago that I grew up in. Um, but um, yeah, I, I fit in. I think, and yeah. and it seems to to fit in me. But how did you happen to come here? Um, what was it, 1999, I think? I came here to do a performance, poetry, uh, at one of Harvard's, um, Longfellow Hall is where it was. Oh, yeah. And um, the woman who would eventually cast her lot with me, she just happened to be there. And uh, we talked to each other, and uh, she came out to something else I was doing while I was here over the, those three days, and we spent time together. And from that point on, um, before I left to go back to Chicago, we decided uh, that we wanted to make this a thing. And thankfully, because of two things that were in abundance at the time, which was Southwest in an abundance of cheap flights coming into Providence, and they also would allow one to change the date that you want to fly back. And then there was also, that, that allowed me to stay longer because of the way my job was, the way I, I make a living, is that I did have some, I could have two or three weeks between engagements. And um, the other thing that made it easy was this burgeoning thing just beginning at the time called the internet. Hi. And, and because of the internet, also accompanying that with, with cheap phone calls and cheap flights, it made uh, an otherwise uh, impossible relationship happen. Workable. Yeah. Very workable, absolutely. Yeah. And and uh, Katie is a Lexington. She she yes. grew up here. Yeah, she grew up here, right here in Lexington. Right, and she did. She did. As a matter of fact, we're in the home uh, that she grew up. In. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, she and she's assistant principal at Estabrook. She is assistant principal at Estabrook. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, she's very scary. Assistant principals are always scary. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were always the disciplinarians. Yeah. You know, when I, when right. I came up. Um, she's somewhat less scary at home. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat less. But, um, but yeah, but yeah, that's, that's her role. But she, she, she's, not, she's not the sort of Teutonic you know, principal that I grew up with, you know, right. um, uh, back in the days when you could beat children, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But she's much more about conflict resolution and getting parties together to talk about what was the thing that initiated this, how can we go about avoiding it. Yeah. She's much more about, about 
trying to find the differences and, and quelling them in a way rather than lending toward punishment. Now, was she a teacher when you met her? Yes, actually, she was. Um, she was teaching preschool when we first met, and then uh, shortly after that, she started teaching at a place called Neighborhood House in Dorchester, uh-huh. and uh, she taught there for several years. And then she uh, a position opened up in in Lexington at Esterbrook, and she went for that. And she got that position, and so she taught in the classroom for nine years here in Lexington, but she's been teaching previous to that, Yeah, you know. But she taught about nine years in the classroom in Lexington, and then she became assistant principal just last year. Yeah, yes. yeah. And is she enjoying it? I imagine she is. Oh, yeah, she she does it. She does enjoy it. Um, I, I, I have gotten very good at back rubs and, and foot rubs and foot massages because <laughs> yeah. it, it's not an easy job. You know? Yeah, I see. Um, you imagine being a parent yeah. having to deal with one child. You imagine having to deal with hundreds. Yeah, right. And, and then having to also deal with the staff. And that position, as I'm coming to see it, is more political than I would have thought it would be. You know, having to navigate what parents want, having to navigate what the superintendent wants, having to navigate what what the school committee needs, having to navigate mm-hmm. what each child needs, having to deal with Metco, having to deal with this. There's a lot of, of of smoothing over and political stuff that has to get done. Not political in the bad way, but political in the sense of yeah. of what's possible to do given the yeah. confines of of what's available. Yeah, and uh, she seems to be rather adept at um, at navigating those. Well, I am. Um, have- Served on a committee or two with her. And I yeah, yes, that. right, you have. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, tell me what what uh, you you have a couple of kids that I we do whom we do I we see do. around. Yes, we do. We do. Jordan, who's fifteen years of age, and uh, McKenna, who is ten years of age, and uh, they are really most days a very beautiful pair. <laughs> <laughs> there are some days when they can test one's limits. Yes, yeah. But, but yeah. that's the way it goes. I know I'm not telling any parent out there anything they don't already know. <laughs> and and they're pretty active in town too. They are. They are. They are. They are. They play music. Um, my, my son Jordan, he's uh, he's in uh, several, a couple of music projects at LHS. Um, he uh, also plays with William Diamond Jr. Uh, drum and Five Corps. And he's also does a lot of stuff with scouts. He was SPL. Now he's just a regular scout. Um, but he does a lot of stuff with scouts. He's very involved. And McKenna is also, he plays with All Town Band. He's doing that stuff. He's also doing um, uh, William Diamond Jr., uh, Drum and Five Corps. And he's also in scouts now in the same troop, Troop 10, which his brother uh-huh. is in. Um, McKenna also sings at the church. He also uh, does a lot of stuff with the Lexington uh, youth players, so he does a lot of a lot of um, the musicals that have to do that, yeah. that that is put on by that. So yeah, they're pretty pretty active in in a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah that's great. Now you 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 said you lived in Belmont yeah. first, and mm-hmm. then moved to Lexington. Um, has uh, has it changed uh, particularly in the years that you've been here? Do you Lexington think? itself. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's. I'm seeing more of what Lexington is, given how much more I've become involved yeah. in things. Um, you know, I'm more involved now in in things which are about town government. Not involved, but I'm looking at that stuff more, and really seeing what goes on behind, uh, seeing more of what happens behind the scenes of things, um, and how much it really takes to keep anything going. Yeah, you know, for, in, for any length of time. You know, these. Um, I would say. I've probably gotten more involved politically in things. Uh, people who I know have gotten more involved politically in things. I don't know if that's a matter of local town politics, state politics, or national politics. Uh, but this has always been a place that has been about all three, <laughs> from what I can understand. Um, I would say since I've been here, the the center, the community center, has opened up, which is a great place for people to go. I think is massively underutilized, uh, but that's a good thing that has changed since I since I since I've been here. Um, I would say I've met more people and there are more people who, who I have an affinity with. And there are also more people I've met who we have some philosophical differences with each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, is that a matter of the town changing? I don't know if it's that in my 10 years of having been here, but I think I've changed as a result of what I've experienced in the town, um, for those 10 years during those 10 years. Yeah. Now, 
always a, a lot of talk, Reggie, about diversity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but there are, there are more African Americans in the town at the time of the revolution mm -hmm. than there are today. I did hear that. I haven't read that, but I did hear that, yes. And and it's kind of weird. Right. Um, the, uh, um, I'm not quite sure why that's true. Well, first I would ask a question, which is, which is were those African Americans free? Well, uh, there were a half a dozen um, Free African American families and about an equal number of slaves. Okay, so so there was about so we're talking twenty four families or something yeah. like that, yeah. something like that, or or eighteen yeah. families. Okay, and I know from what I understand, I was just with someone yesterday, and I have to look up these numbers, and I got two separate numbers that there were approximately someone said there was about six hundred African Americans. In this town, I don't know if that would include also Africans or people who are from South America who would be considered to also be black, but but someone also said there were two hundred families. So I'm not sure. I haven't checked the numbers. My feeling is there is a there's not a lot. Yeah, that's my feeling. There's not a lot. I mean, I and my two boys yeah. are the only uh, African Americans at our church. Yeah, you know who attend. Um, I don't see a lot of uh, people who. De, who phenotypically resemble my dem demographic around town very much, um, particularly in my age group, you know, which, yeah. is, which is that between that 45 and 55 right. years, years of age. I don't, I don't typically see, see that. Um, of course, there's a lot of young people who are coming in on the daily five days a week because of Metco and, and they're coming in. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, as far as town residents, that is my feeling too, is that there's, um, there's not a lot. Yes, and, yeah. and strangely, I've been here since 49. Wow. It's not a recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. what, what has happened, as you know well, is that the town is now about 25% Asian. Yes. Uh, which was not true when I moved here, yes. obviously. It was, yes. It was Yankee, Italian, and uh, mm -hmm. Irish. Ah. Uh, but then, uh, then there was an enormous growth in the Asian population, and it, you know, in in uh, say Framingham, mm -hmm. you you get a, a large Hispanic population mm -hmm. sort of clustering, and then right. Lawrence, you get a clustering of Vietnamese, uh, yes, uh, of people, and Southeast Asian, right. Um, so it is diverse in, in, in one sense, um, just not as diverse as, as, yeah. as the United States is. But, you know, Lexington is, um, is a community that is it's expensive to live in. Yes. You know, it's expensive to live in. And, and so that, that puts it outside of the, the possibility for, um, I think, most Americans, mm -hmm. you know, most Americans. And um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is right now. Uh, maybe some folks I know are working on ways of changing that or at least challenging that, that, uh, that fact. But um, I guess we'll wind up seeing if that actually winds up happening. But um, diversity for me is also not strictly about, about um, ethnic diversity. It's about diversity of thinking, diversity of approach, oh. um, you know, diversity of, 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 of how, we, you know, uh, how we do the American thing. And um, I'm not sure how much of that people feel uh, is allowed here to be to be that diverse because this place is so filled with American history, yeah, right. And and history naturally carries with it a an, a, um, a need to preserve, yeah, you know, yeah, which is yeah. which is a need to conserve, which is a need to to keep certain things as a mosquito in amber, yeah, right. And and I'm saying I understand that that impulse, and I think that 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 part of that is very necessary, you know, very necessary. We can't continue to build a house unless we have a solid foundation, and the foundation can't continue to keep on shifting, or else the whole structure begins to shift. So we do have to have some fundamental and foundational things, which is going to lend us toward um, keeping certain things preserved that um, some of us might want to see changed. Um. 
let's uh, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who teaches a Professor Baruch in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a, he's a wonderful, mm -hmm. something of an iconoclast. And he goes to faculty meetings, uh -huh. and he says, following up on what you were just saying, he says, uh, we think we're so diverse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we have an African-American professor, and we have an Italian professor, and we have an Indian-American, and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah, we're not diverse. We, we just may look differently, but we're <laughs> all the same people. We think all the same way. Yes. And that's what you were saying. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I was asked once to be on a panel for, um, for a university that I had attended, um, getting my master's degree, and they wanted me to, to, to be on the panel to talk about how do we make things more diverse. And the first thing I said was, well, you know, um, we need people who think differently, not just people who look differently, because that is what it needs. And, and we tend to not be as tolerant of different ways of thinking many times as we are with different ways of how people look. Now, can you be a, a little more specific? What, what would constitute... Uh, diversity of thinking in Lexington as Lexington is now. Well, that's a good question. I would I would say if I'm thinking about again, I've only been here ten years, you yeah. know, and and you know you've been here since 1949. So when it comes down maybe to that, I would say let's look at um, some of the thinking we have around. Let's go in, even into the schools. Some of the the, the thinking that we have around um, suspension rates of African American boys. Let's just say. Um, Part of what I think is going on with that is a traditional way of thinking about African American boys, troublemakers. Uh, they're from, they're coming from outside of our neighborhood into this place. If there was a a different way of looking at African American boys, let's say there were more African American teachers who came through an African American uh, culture, perhaps the move toward punishment of those boys would be greeted with another kind of cultural understanding mm -hmm. that would better help them facilitate how to make connections into this culture that they have to come to every morning, which is the culture of Lexington, right? And so there, there's not much going on. Uh, there is some, there is some, I will say that, going on of saying this needs to be addressed. We need to figure out how to culturally think, shift the ways we think to deal with how these kids think so we can better educate them and facilitate them uh, into our community. So that's one thing I would say and, is amongst and the education. so we can better understand. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but, but, but realistically, these, these kids are going to be coming, if they continue to go through the MEDCO program, they're going to be in this school, you know, some of them for 10 years. Yeah. You know, and so that's a sort of way of thinking that I would think is all the way from the elementary level clear up to the high school level, right? Now, that's kind of discouraging, Reggie, mm -hmm. because we've only had Metco, Metco since the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. you, th you think we might have caught on by now? Well, certain things. Yeah, I think there are certain things which, 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 which are working. But, but, you know, as we also know with anything, you know, democracy itself is a process that is always having to self-correct, right? Yeah. And so anything that we've been doing since the 1960s, we know we can't think that we've done it, it's over, that's it, let's move on. It's like, no, 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 we've initiated it, we've got it rolling. Now as this car sort of goes down the street, let's see what we need to, to tweak in order to make mm -hmm. sure that it stays on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so that's what I'm, what I'm hoping is we're doing. And I see this ebb and flow going back and forth. It's just you never know which part of our way of thinking, our more conservative, uh, part match it against our more liberal part, however we want to say those things. Which one of those is, can those things talk to each other and come to truth instead of talking at each other and then determining no punishment? No, 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 no punishment. They don't need this, they need that. So I would like to see how that, how that actually plays itself out in mm -hmm. education. That's one of the things that I'm, that I'm seeing um, as far as this, uh, as far as what I'm looking at, as far as a different way of thinking that I think could affect mm -hmm. Lexington. Mm -hmm. you know. um, politically, um, is there you concerned by the lack of diversity in town? Um, I am. I mean, I didn't um, really, I looked around and, and saw like, wow, there's hardly any people of color who are any town government, you know? Yeah. And um, I'm myself, I'm just really getting interested in, in 
Good. In, in, You're going to run for town, <laughs> ain't he? Um, no, <laughs> I won't. I would say not now. I don't feel I know enough right now to run for to run for town meeting. Um, and also, you know, I've, I've uh, witnessed enough of the um, the slings and arrows that seem to get tossed at people who, <laughs> who cast their hat into the fray. But um, but but possibly, possibly someone has yeah, asked me that question be before, before. And, and I, I'd want to just sit back and, and, and learn more and see what's really going on with the town. But yes, that, that getting back to your idea about the lack of diversity. Um, that is that is a bit disturbing. Um, I don't know if it's a matter of of the majority population, uh, also white population, won't vote for someone who is of a different ethnicity, or if it's just that those folks don't run. You well, know? I didn't see too many Trump signs around town. <laughs> From what I understand, there were three thousand people in Lexington who voted for yeah. Trump, of which they had the right to. Uh, but I didn't see much, much, many of much of that either. You know, certainly I saw much more going toward New Hampshire than I saw here. You know, it's the flip side of the way it was when I was here. Mm -hmm. When I first came, um, it was it, nice people weren't Democrats, you know? <laughs> uh, and and so the, there was no Democratic Party. And uh -huh. nobody voted in Democratic primaries. Wow. Uh, there, there was about a third of the town voted Democratic in mm -hmm. state and, and uh, national elections, but they were really hidden. Um, they didn't show themselves no, in town they politics? they sure wow. didn't. It was, not, it was not appropriate. Was it much more a Republican sort of stronghold? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Heavy, two to one. Um, it was so... I ran for, <clears throat> for state rep and... 1952 was an avowed Democrat, a Yankee Democrat, uh -huh. which was really weird. And um, uh, Jolly Ferguson was the, one of the two reps from the district. He was town moderator. And, and uh, the, the night before the election, Reggie, uh -huh. I, there was some kind of thing at Cary Hall, and he was there. And I went up to him and did the you know, good campaign stuff, and right. reached out my hand, and and he he totally ignored me. Oh. And I realized that the chief of police, John Rycroft, was standing right behind him. Mm -hmm. And when Rycroft moved away, Charlie came rushing up to me and was very warm and and oh. very gracious. Oh. But he wasn't going to. Be that Let way with the police chief see him being gracious to a Democrat. Oh. That was the way the town <laughs> was. Wow. And and now it's wow. just you know, just really the other way around. I mean, yeah. I would I would hate to be a Trump supporter in this town. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, one would one would think you'd be pretty lonely in, yeah, in, exactly. in, in many in many cases. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um Something else you you said you were uh, you met Katie when you were in in Cambridge yes. doing a, a, a you said a the poetry reading yeah it was something called the Cambridge Poetry Awards and um, I had been invited in along with uh, three or four other people from Chicago no 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 we were from from two of us were from Chicago another person was from Cleveland one other person was from Washington D C and so they invited the four of us in. Who did? Uh, this was Jeff Robinson is his name. He he is a musician and also um, he I think he still works with the Cambridge Multicultural Arts Center. Oh, I know that place. Yeah, I, was yeah. On that board I think he still works with them. Oh, you were? Oh, great, yeah. great, great. So yeah. that's where you you were? No, no, no. We were. We were uh, uh, he works for them now. At the time, he he was oh. running something out of a place called the Lizard Lounge, which is in uh, in Cambridge. Uh, well, he still does that, but but this was all around Cambridge. They were having different festival type things around poetry. That was with the mm -hmm. Cambridge Center for Adult Education, and and those few few spots around. And and they had a culminating performance that was at the Longfellow House. So that's that's where there I was. and Radcliffe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, right there. And and how how did this group come together and? How did you have? Oh, I don't know. I was in Chicago at the time. Um, what happened is is I had come here. Pardon me, to Massachusetts because some some other friends of mine had invited me to to do a performance. I had won something called the um, had I won it at the time? Well, it was called the national the uh, uh, national 
uh, individual national poetry slam champion title. And so they wanted me to come in and, um, and, and do sort of a tour around Massachusetts. But before that, I had come in the year before, met some people, came down to a place, shook a few hands. When I won this, I was invited to come back and be part of um, a group of poets who were moving through Massachusetts in various places. And um, so they called me and invited me, put me on a plane, I came here. That's pretty much it. So I, I, I know you're a Renaissance man, and I know you, <laughs> you uh, do sermons and music and poetry. What, what do you, if I, if I ran into you on the street and said, <laughs> Reggie, what are you? Uh, Professionally, well, well, well what, I, what I normally tell people is I'm a literary performer and educator. And what that means for me is that I take literature, whether it is written or spoken or sang, and I try to lift it um, to a performative space. Um, I also teach as well. I do a lot of stuff in colleges. I'm going to be teaching for Clark University, this, this Clark and Leslie, this uh, October, this fall, and I teach for Let, for Emerson during the summer. So I teach intersections between poetry, literature, and also music and performance. I work with, have a group called Shakespeare to Hip Hop, in which we take some of the works of William Shakespeare and also historical con uh, things about William Shakespeare, and we use American music in order to, to show why Shakespeare should be important to Americans. So we use funk, hip hop, blues, jazz, country, uh, pop um, as ways of contextualizing um, in vehicles to promote the works of William Shakespeare, who, by the way, his birthday was yesterday, April 23rd. Yeah. From, from what we understand, you know, there's so much about, about the man that we don't really know. But from what okay. we understand, it's generally understood that he, he was born April 23, 1564. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's fascinating. I didn't know about. Uh, about that involvement mm. interest of yours. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a there's an organization in Cambridge which which I'm involved called the Old Cambridge Shakespeare Association. Really? Goes back 135 years. You okay. know when a lot of these were springing up around uh, sort of New Shakespeare England. societies. Is that what you mean? Or? And it's it's it was in Old Cambridge, which is the area around the square. And we get together every month and read a Shakespeare play. Oh, yeah? What and I mean? always get neat parts like Second Murderer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, there's quite a few of those. It's, you know? yeah, yeah. it's quite a few of those. So you must be working a lot with this. <laughs> yeah, that's you know. right. Well, typecasting. Is, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you play that role well, Dan. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe that's what it is. So, <laughs> so, so. Most of us, Reggie, we set the mm -hmm. alarm clock and we get up and we go to the office <laughs> at nine and we come right. home in the afternoon. What what's your your life like? You're, you're doing this teaching mm -hmm. and you're doing performances around. Um, life is always involved in doing something that has to do with either um, literature or performance whether I am writing lyrics for someone, um, composing um, uh, school songs for people, um, spackling whatever cracks I might have in any of the various uh, performances that I have to do, whether I'm scheduling rehearsals or writing lesson plans or conversing with uh, schools about the, the uh, educational needs of their students and how I might best be able to come in for a three-week residency and fulfill that is constantly something going on. There's not really a day that I really rest. Um, it is the weekends can sometimes be even worse um, because that's the day when um, I get to really drill down because a lot of drill down on stuff because most of the things I have to do on the weekend happen at night. So the days are oh, usually, yeah. usually fairly yeah. free. So I can I can really drill down. So it, it uh, sometimes my wife has to, has to remind me to eat. <laughs> you know, okay. yeah. She just remind me to eat, or I said, "Man, I got a headache." She's like, "Did you eat? Did you did you drink any water?" You know, like, "Oh, yeah, yeah." So it's it's constantly something, and the summertime um, is 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 crazy. The summertime gets crazy as well. So I'll be teaching for three places during the summer: Emerson, 
I'll also be at a place called Grub Street, which is uh, downtown. I'll teach there for, for three weeks, two weeks, Emerson for five. No, Grub Street for three weeks, Emerson for five weeks. So they're overlap. What's and Grub Street? Grub Street is an independent writer's center. It is um, one of the uh, largest, I think, in the United States and certainly one of the most active in Boston. And it takes um, individuals who want to write and trains them on how to do so. And uh, they're celebrating 20 years this year. Yay, 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 yay. And I've taught um, their young people in something called the YAWP program, Young Adult Writers Program. We get the YAWP part from Walt Whitman's, um, one of his oh, poems. Yeah, you sure. know, I, I sound my, my barbaric YAWP across the world's rooftops. Yeah. And teaching young people how, how uh, if you're going to rant, and young people are going to rant, yeah. then there is an articulate way to rant, and yeah. we want to teach them how to do that. But hopefully also give them some literary skills in the meantime. So I'll teach, so I work with that. We have a wonderful program where we pay young people to write. It's the summer fellowship is we give them we give them money. We bring them in for three weeks. We train them on, on intersections between both poetry and uh, nonfiction, but also also fiction. And uh, if they make the cut, we give them dough. We actually pay them to be there. So it's a paid fellowship for them. And the third place I teach with this summer will be with the Massachusetts Poetry Poetry uh, Festival. They have um, a professional development. Um, uh, weeks that I teach teachers how to best implement literature in the classrooms. So all of that's happening within five weeks in the summer. How, how, how to build literature into their... Into their curriculums. I give them uh, the various curricula. I give them ideas for, for um, what to do with creative writing, and, and the work they have to teach, which is some of the stuff they have to teach poetry and, and what to do, but also how to link my ideas and the ideas I'm giving them with Massachusetts frameworks, with, with the curriculum of what the Massachusetts frameworks have to, uh, have to have. So that tends to work. And I love doing that work because I get teachers of all different grades who come in. Someone, it's, it's mostly pitched, most of my pitching is toward middle school and high school. But um, any teacher can come in, and they'll just have to adjust whatever it is that they get. And I tend, I've been able to give many of them ideas of what to do to sort of pitch it to their own students and how it might match up with Massachusetts framework, ma mass frameworks. What happened to the good great New England poets, Lowell and Whittier and Longfellow? They and, died. Yeah, why? They died. Well, I know they died. Okay. <laughs> you mean what happened to them? Why don't we, why don't we read them anymore? Yeah. Because um, I... That's right. I was brought up with Emerson uh, and yeah. Whittier yeah. and I. Yes, I mean Emerson and Thoreau were were for me. Uh, well, Emerson, you know, I, I prefer him as an essayist. Yeah. Over, you know, he's a yeah, bit yeah. more didactic in his poetry than than, yeah. than I prefer. Uh, I think it was um, another New England poet, Denise Levertov, who said it's really difficult to make a good poem out of ought to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Okay. And, and Emerson, Emerson has a lot of ought to going yeah. on as far as his poetry, but, but you know, being a good uh, a good essayist, he was he was second to none, you know, yeah. um, and and you know, whosoever should be a man should be a nonconformist, and all the things that he has to say, and, and um, some of the things I could only imagine. Well, I've read, but I could just imagine how he must have sounded coming from the pulpit you know, yeah, for that yeah. time when he was a Unitarian minister, and um, and Thoreau, of course. Um, for me, uh, has been you know an inspiration uh, ever since I first you know heard his name mentioned by both writings of King and 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 Gandhi, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I even wrote a, uh, a couple of sort of almost rap type things about about Emerson and Thoreau because I wanted kids who listen more to more modern music to really understand um, what these guys were about, what the transcendentalist. Uh, way of thinking was about, and how, so you put that into rap. Yeah, well, yeah. What what I took to be their uh, the thrust of what they were saying and what they're trying to get across, and what it means for us in modern day. I could do one for you if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Henry Thoreau told civilization, "Yo, I gotta go. I need a vacation." So he went out to Walden, where he got this revelation. Whoa. So many of us live lives of quiet desperation. Lo and behold, another transcendentalist quotation seems to capture the essence of a modern vexation. It's as if Thoreau knew that in the future you and I would have to act in radical ways to mitigate the sad fact that 
Because we've got to slave to keep our bills paid, sometimes it seems our minds are kind of ripe to get played by the vultures in our culture who only hope to withhold us from anything any deeper than work while we scold you, buy what we told you, pay what you owe, uh, and we'll ensure you've got a debt you'll never get over. Treating human beings as if we're merely skin machines where the cash is, some sick profiteers, demographics, puppets who are made of plastic, molded and mastered, stretched thin as thread till we're bled dead into our caskets. Oh, we try to contrast it by coming off sarcastic, but we hate this situation, and the situation is so drastic that many of us will huff and puff and snort all kinds of stuff to get blasted, hoping, hoping to deaden the pain, but we find that that just never lasts. And... Sometimes it makes the masses act more passive, which keeps our minds inactive to the plans of the fascists who hope to keep you and I separated into races and genders and classes because, well, that's how you maintain the status quo status as is. But don't let them head fake you. Shake and bake and back break you down to the ground, come around, clown and undertake you. You got to fight back. And my advice is use whatever poetry is trapped inside of you as your weapon. Do you dig? So that for me is more of a somewhere between jazz and, and, and rap. Yeah. You know, but it's also sort of like a, mono, a monologue as well. It, an introduction of young people to to um, the ideas of, of, of finding your own center, um, being um, suspicious of what's being told to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean dismissive, you know, but it does mean being suspicious. I was actively asked to leave a school once, not in Massachusetts, but I was giving a speech and I said, to young people that you should be extraordinarily suspicious. Do not put 100% of your trust into any organization or individual who claims to act in your best interest but never asks your opinion. Yeah. And, and uh, one school, which shall remain nameless, um, said, thank you, Mr. Gibson, here's your check. And... Um, Go home. Yes, <laughs> you know, get get out of here, and and um, and so so that harks back to, I was mentioning earlier the Emersonian quote, you know, whosoever shall be a man, and we'll expand that to whoever will be a free thinking human being, must to some degree, become a nonconformist, not to just accept what's been told to you, but to say, okay, well, let me see how much that comports and conforms to truth, both observable, both both researched. Um, and whether or not it actually makes ethical and moral sense for me to, to, to approach this action. And if someone's asking you to do something that does not sound true, does not, you've studied and it doesn't seem true, it seems like a falsehood, and it's asking you to do something that you know goes against what you, what you understand to be your ethical and moral center, it's time for you to take a break from that and, and not go in that direction. And um, that's my, my thought about about what what I hope I try to do is to try to communicate not only factual truth. I'm not a person who believes I should have my own facts, but factual truth along with emotional um, and historical truth as far as how the individual feels about it, feels is right in the heart. Do you think that we've got at the moment sort of a guppy society where, you know, you sort of taking the stuff that, <laughs> Huh? Yes, I think I think uh, information which which passes easily for knowledge nowadays, uh, particularly if if um, if an institution or individual can say it loudly enough, it'll pass for knowledge. I think I think we're, we're we too easily cons- consume that information as truth um, when it is the responsibility of everyone in a democracy if you want it to be viable and continue to work, to go and investigate and see if what someone's actually said to you has any kind of verisimilitude. Mm. And, um, but I think it's also that, that we're overwhelmed with, with places to get information from. Mm-hmm. And it becomes increasingly more difficult, I think, for people to, to wade through it. And plus, um, plus you know, much of our, of our media is entertainment, and entertainment asks that you don't think. Mm-hmm. Thinking in a democracy is a very democracy or a constitutional republic, as I'm sure some of the, some of uh, people might say. It's a difficult thing to constantly keep the mind fortified against untruths, and I can see that, uh, and and also to to meet the responsibilities therein, which means one must go and seek it, and seek facts 
it's a difficult thing to do, to continue to do that. And so some of us, we just turn that part of ourselves off. And as you said, we guppy up. <laughs> yeah. We just, we just get, get fed from another place. And next thing you know, we, we, lose, we lose critical thinking. Kennedy said uh, we, um, too many times we indulge in the um, expression of an opinion without <laughs> at the discomfort of thought. Uh, yes, ab- absolutely, absolutely, you know. So, so um, you're doing this teaching and you're helping teachers put these kinds of thoughts into um, a, a framework yes. which the kids of today can, yes. will respond to. Hopefully. And, and how much... And then you do performances, mm-hmm. and that's, is that poetry mostly? Or? Um, I would say it would, it would go in that direction, yeah. You know, I, sometimes what I call, when I'm teaching students, I call, depending upon how young they are, when they hear poetry, they run away from it. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, my God, a poem is supposed to be this. So I call it sometimes wordplay with a purpose, you know. Um, but yes, it would be forms of verse, forms of, of free verse, forms of sometimes... Um, fixed form poetry, uh, Shakespearean sonnets are fixed form. Um, and I would do that, but I, I might also do soliloquies, parts of soliloquies or speeches like from Henry V. Yeah. I have truncated, a truncated version Hank of- Hank yeah, yeah, exactly, you know? Um, and I have truncated versions of that, um, which, which sort of take out some of the, the distinct Englishisms uh, that might not be uh, necessary for, for us to, to understand really what's going on and talk about issues of manhood um, and whether Henry V was a good leader and how do we look at that. Um, I do that with Shakespeare, but I also go back, I work um, what I, I work a lot with the classics as well. Um, the Iliad is a book that I always go back to and the Odyssey as well. Mm-hmm. I go back to that, it depends upon the population that I'm addressing. Um, my, I wrote a lecture when I was uh, in my master's program. It was called The Iliad as Gangster Rap. Oh, you know, and it was using uh, Achilles as a, and I do this sometimes for schools. Is using Achilles as a sort of modern day gangster rapper um, to say what? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, he's I, called MC A Kill. Not quite sure how that works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can give you, I can give you two minutes on it. Uh, when you when you examine when you when you read the Iliad, right? Yeah. Well, let's look at, at at how it how it begins, right? Man and I did the ah Peleadeo Achilles, right? So you get that that wonderful, yeah, right, you know, right, dactylic right, right. hexametric pulse, and it's something that the cult, culture loves. So it's rhythmic. So there's a rhythm and there's a there's a poetry that happens. There. Okay, so there's clearly a connection between that and hip hop. The other thing about it is that uh-huh. is that there's a bard who's saying it. So there's a there's a there's a um, a, a storyteller who's speaking in in the rhythms of the culture, right. which is what you get which you, what you get in rap, which I like to call it rhythmic American poetry, R A P. The thing that we get from the first thing of the Iliad, right? The first word in the Iliad is manen, which comes from the Greek word manis, which means wrath or anger or rage, right? In English, it says, speak to us, uh, speaking to the muse in the invocation, speak to us of, of the rage of Achilles, Peleus' ah, son, okay. right? And so my thought is, is and then let's go into the story just a second. Achilles, why is he angry? Well, the reason he's angry is because he has not had the chance to sexually violate a captive woman. She's been taken away from him by a person with more authority, and he's actually angry about this, right? And so we have misogyny and anger right there in the very beginning of the, of the longest extant, well, the, the most, the extant text, uh, the Greek extant, extant text that we have, one of the, the first epics that we have as far as in its completion. We get anger and, and we get misogyny right at the beginning. Well, when you listen to a lot of gangster rap, what are you hearing? Yeah. You're hearing anger yeah, and you're hearing okay. misogyny. Now, my thought is, is that if instead of the bard invoking the goddess to, to give the bard himself the words to speak of Achilles, what if Achilles spoke of his own anger, right, and his own feelings, and he came out with talking about his own rage? And, of course, if you know the Iliad, you know that there, every time someone kills someone on the battlefield, they give this long list of their accomplishments and who they are. They give their pedigree. They're bragging, 
you know, essentially about how tough and how much swagger they have. Well, that's what happens a lot in gangster rap. There's a lot of bragging about how tough they are and how, how they can take out anybody. Well, it's the same thing the Greeks do. And of course, talk about violence. Homer never kills anybody without giving you an excruciating amount of detail as to how that individual died, right? And so my thought is, is Achilles was praised for his prowess, right? And in prowess in battle, especially with the Greeks, you get, you get uh, what is it? Um, uh, the geras, which is uh, which is one of the the um, the things that you get uh, for for war, physical things. Your geras might be a chariot, shielding, or the ultimate thing you get is a woman. Mm-hmm. That's what's appointed to you from your boys. Mm-hmm. And so the small thing of the Iliad is gangster rap. Is what if I was to take men and I de thea peleadeo achilleos and make that into a hook? Men and I de thea Achilles, which means speak goddess of the anger of Achilles, but have Achilles speak of his anger and his prowess mm-hmm. in battle. Mm-hmm. How would it sound? Well, Achilles might say, everybody knows I'm the greatest warrior in Greece, and when I kill a man, I kill a man with skill and ease. I don't think about it or waste a lick of time to everything of purpose and making war is mine. I don't care for some cowardly way of taking a man out from some point far away. It takes steel nerves and a pair of brass, you know what's to step into a man and then stab him in the guts. And then, you know, and he goes on, he goes on, you know, and, 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 and he talks about how he does this. So if Achilles talked about it instead of the, instead of the bar talking about it in the rhythms of his culture, given the values of his culture, he'd be very synonymous to a gangster rapper. You know, it reminds me of Faulkner's famous quote, Reggie, mm-hmm. the past isn't dead, it's not even past. <laughs> it's a very great quote. It's, huh? it's, it's still with us. We're yeah. still part of it. I mean, mm-hmm. that has that contextualized a lot of what's with males in Western culture, yeah. you know, when we look at that, you know. Um, that's why I study the epics, they and, and Shakespeare and all that, because this is an encyclopedia of, of, of Western culture for us to understand psychologically how we got this way, yeah. particularly what it means to be man, how manhood has changed, how it's not in certain things. You know, uh, What does swagger mean to the ancient Greeks? Well, what did it mean in Shakespeare's age? What does it mean nowadays? What did it mean to John Wayne versus... Adam Clayton Powell. You know, yeah. Chuck Stone wrote a book about the swagger, I think. Mm-hmm. Of Adam Clayton Powell? About, about Powell. Mm-hmm. It was a Powell mm-hmm. uh, biography. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll check that out. Yeah. You know? Well, and how did you get into this? This is a very unusual um, kind of line of work. Is that <laughs> well, if I was to do, I've done some slight forensics on it. My, uh, my great-grandfather, uh, who I knew, is uh, he was a railway worker, and he was illiterate. So he had to create stories and rhymes and songs as mnemonic devices so he could remember things. And we used to say that, you know, when Great Grandpa, um, if he could remember a story, pardon me, if he could remember a story completely without missing a step, the story was probably not completely true. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it was when he started trying to smack his forehead and bumble through it, he was really trying to remember, then it probably had some truth to it. But when it came down to, to that, if he could remember it, it was like, no, that's something he practiced because he needed to remember something. And so I trace that, that sort of back to him. And he would sing uh, these railroad songs that he would make up because he was the caller, uh, as, as, we, as, as he's known, which is the person who sings the songs uh-huh. so that people can swing the hammer in rhythm. And so one of oh, his songs, okay. right, so that uh-huh. was his job. Yeah. And so he would sing one song I remember, I am working now, huh, all day long, Lord, huh, here comes the sun, huh, traveling tracks of sky, huh, oh, 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 Lord. Huh. And, and as I got older, you know, my grandmother would sing a song, she was very Christian, and, and those songs kind of went together. They kind of melded like that. My brother and I, we still talk about that moment when her spiritual love song to God and his, his uh, secular work song sort of melded and it seemed to be seamless for a moment even when it seemed that they couldn't get along. Um, and, and for us, we still talk about whatever it was that was in that blending. You know, my, my mm-hmm. brother is now a grandfather 
and and we I think for myself I'm trying to journey back to whatever that sound was uh-huh. right okay. I, I think for me I'm trying to get back to what that space was when I examined my grandfather's song who who if you told him he was doing poetry he probably would say no he was just singing what was in his heart and I look at what he was singing about him he was making a metaphor here comes the sun traveling up tracks of sky but what he was doing was taking taking an image from yeah, yeah, his yeah. daily work and superimposing that right yeah. With, with something that he saw every day. So he saw mm-hmm. this train every day, he saw the, tr- the, the sun every day, and the, the train becomes the sun and the sky mm-hmm. becomes the tracks and it was a natural blending of metaphor mm-hmm. that happened where he saw them as the same thing mm-hmm. uh, in the song. And because of him, I think I trace it back to that. And the second influence was my Uncle Larry who gave me, and I didn't bring it with me today, I, sh- I didn't think to bring it, it was uh, he gave me a, a, a dictionary for my seventh birthday. And uh, my uncle Larry was um, was uh, was a drug abuser. I didn't know that at the time. Who who felt when I look back on his life that he had nothing really to offer. And when he gave me this dictionary, he says, "You know, you're pretty good with those words. I got no use for this. You take this." And I've had that book with me for approximately 43 years. I take it to almost every school I go to. Should have brought it today, like I said. And um, I started reading that book about a year and a half later. And it was about 300 pages, and I started just reading, reading, reading the dictionary. And um, even though at the time I didn't think of it as a gift, I'm like, well, thanks, Unc, for a book, you know. It has no batteries, no lights, yeah. it doesn't make noise. <laughs> you know? right. I'm seven years old. Later on, I really found how much of a gift uh, that he was giving me. And maybe my uncle saw something, certainly, that I didn't really see yeah, you right. know, at the time. So if I trace it going back, I would say... Those are two very Those formative two. experiences yeah. that I think brought me into what I do. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm awfully grateful to you for taking this time. And, I'm glad to be and, asked. And uh, I, uh, I said when we started that Reggie was <laughs> one of the jewels, one of the treasures uh, in our town, and uh, certainly this, this hour is has uh, shown that to be true. Thank you, sir. So thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you.